There we go. <laughs> Wrong one. I got to get the right one on there. It's not that one anymore. I got to change the name. There we go. How's everybody doing today? We're on just a little bit early. Doesn't really officially start until uh, another eight minutes, but I've got uh, several people on YouTube, several people on uh, LinkedIn. Let me flip back over to the comments section. There we go. George is on here. George, you're supposed to be working. Yep. So let me, um, something is talking. I don't know what it is. All right, it's my headset. Who else is here besides George? Put your uh, put your name in the comment field. Let's know who you are. Tell me where you're from, too. Like I said, this is kind of like the pre-show. We're just kind of waiting, get on for a few minutes, and uh, and let people know that we're here and stuff like that. The I uh, got lots of good questions for today's Q and A section. So hopefully. Uh, It'll do you guys some good. If you have any questions, put them in the chat box, the comment field. I know George is already there. George, do you have any questions you want to answer? He's, he's one of my most loyal fans. He's almost on all the time, all the time. Not a problem. He says he's at work, but he'll listen. So very cool. Hey, hey love, can you just check, make sure the audio is coming across there with it? It is? Okay. All right, good. So the audio check turns out fine. So so who are my people in the room? Like I said, I know there's a few of you out there. Oops, my phone just kind of clicked away. Uh, <clears throat> six minutes and counting. Hope everybody had a wonderful New Year's, Christmas, holiday season. I kind of went off keto and gained 20 pounds over that time period. But that's okay. January 1, I went back to hardcore keto. For those who don't know, I lost 70 pounds last year during COVID. Everybody's gaining weight. I was losing weight doing keto. And it was the easiest thing I've ever done. You know, because you get to eat the good stuff like bacon and meat. And and did I mention bacon? Yeah, you get to eat all the good stuff. And I lost 70 pounds. You want proof of it? Go look at the uh, my other YouTube channel, The Bowser Journal, and go back about eight, nine months. Look at those videos. You will see a chubby Chuck. <laughs> chubby Chuck. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. I lost 70 pounds. Real happy. I'm actually had to buy two different sets of wardrobes. Again, for those who just joined, we we're five minutes until we start the broadcast. So, geez. <laughs> yep. So it just says LinkedIn user. So I don't know who that is. So in, in a thing, just tell us who you are and where you're from. I know George is from Florida. I'm from Florida. Um, where's everybody else from? Funny thing, you probably wonder why Chuck's wearing two shirts today. This morning, it was 41 degrees outside my house. 41 degrees. I'm beginning to wonder if I live in the frozen tundra or Florida. Just saying. Yeah. 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 It gets cold. My animals sure don't like it. Uh you know, this has actually become one of my favorite things to do because uh, I get to interact with you guys live and get to have kinds of questions. Ah, well, I know you now. Welcome to the channel, Mr. Unidentified LinkedIn user. Had a good day at work today. I briefed a new RSM coming on board. I worked on some updating some PowerPoint stuff. It's a good productive day. Good productive day. So, again, if you have a question, this is a Q&A session. If you have any questions about communications, career, Q&A, estimating, project management, make sure you put it in the chat box, right? As I always say, the people who submit the questions in advance get preference. But if I run out, I will definitely answer your questions as well. I don't like leaving unanswered questions. If you don't know, I have a podcast. It's called Let's Talk Cabling. We are about 18 episodes in, 18, 19 episodes in. We just finished a project management series. I come back up north and see how cold it is. No, thank you. <laughs> you probably noticed the Maryland flag in the back. I am from Maryland originally. Uh, there's a reason I moved from Maryland, and that's because I don't like snow. There you go. You have it in a nutshell. I don't like shoveling snow. I am coming back to the area, though, On uh, in a couple weeks. I'm flying up on a Friday, and I'm picking up our new puppy. 
Yes, are we are getting a brand new German Shepherd? To we we had three, actually two in a in a in a, in a mixed breed. Two of them died this year in 2020, so we're getting a new puppy. Looking forward to that as well. So got another two minutes or so. Yep. I remember a funny story before we get started. I uh, went on a business trip one time. I lived in College Park, Maryland. Went on a business trip, flew to Mexico City to do a project. Was there for about two and a half to three weeks. While I was gone, the D.C. area got nailed with about 12 to 14 inches of snow. And I was laughing at everybody because I'm in Mexico City. I'm like, ha, 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 you got to shovel snow. Ah, I don't. I'm in Mexico. And uh, so the funny thing is when I got back to the airport, first thing I had to do was um, <laughs> I actually had to shovel my truck out of the snow in the airport parking lot. And, and I didn't have a shovel. And my truck was two-wheel drive, not four-wheel drive. So I had to shovel it out. It took me about an hour and a half after traveling all day long. And then I uh, drove home. I, li had, I lived on this real little narrow street in College Park, Maryland. Actually, a subdivision called um, Hollywood, Maryland, Hollywood College Park. Real small little subdivision. I normally park my truck on the street. And then at the time, my ex-wife used to park the van up in the driveway so I pulled up to my house, and evidently the city of College Park saw that open spot in front of my house, and that's where they decided to shovel all the snow. So I had a pile of snow that was taller than my C20 truck. I had to shovel another pile of snow. So I guess that was my, uh, my uh, issue, I mean, not my issue, my punishment for going to warm weather. So that is why I don't like snow. don't like shoveling it. Snow's pretty to look at. It's pretty for about the first 12 hours. Yeah. Exactly. Snow emergency route. Exactly right. But uh, yeah, don't like snow. So I moved to Florida where we have hurricanes. Okay. Big deal. Been here for about 20 years. Lived through a couple of hurricanes. Nothing big. About one minute to show time. Love being in Florida. Have a three acre homestead here. We have goats and geese and rabbits and chickens and ducks. And we have a steer named Duke. You want to see all that stuff? That's on the Bowser Journal on our YouTube channel. So that's pretty cool, too. We just added a male goat, a blue-eyed male goat. Boy, is he gorgeous. So about 15 seconds to show time. So nobody has any questions, huh? So I guess I'll just go with the pre-sent questions ahead of time. So 10 seconds and counting. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Hope everybody has their drink. And in five, four, three, two, one. And welcome to the After Hours Live Q&A session with Chuck Bowser, RCDD. Welcome to the first one. Oh, I turned that light down a little bit. Welcome to the first one. There we go. It's better. First one of 2021. So this is a... Uh, um. Uh, first one for the season. Oh, actually, I got first question already. So a LinkedIn user wants to know, how long have I been cabling? I have been cabling since 1982. 1982. If you do the math, four, five, carry the one, that's uh, a lot of years. I have almost 40 years of experience in the communications industry. So that's, uh, I've been doing it for a while. I started off like everybody else does. How long have you been vain? Oh, cabling. Yeah, there you go. Um, cabling. There we go. There, there we go. Um, so I've been doing it for a long time. When I first started doing cabling, everything was actually coax or some type of proprietary system. And, uh, it was kind of cool. So I got to see the whole industry grow. Oh, Hey Dave, how you doing, buddy? Yes. Uh, David quick is here. Nice. David quick. Cool guy. He, uh, him and I used to work together at a small little company called TCI in Springfield, Virginia. Remember him very well. And I remember him because he had the nicest little Mustang. And he was always putting in some kind of new car stereo. And the, the, the funny thing I really remember about him is he used to have um, um, his tag was DR Quick, Dr. Quick. And I used to make fun. What, you think you're a doctor or something? Because no, those are my initials. So welcome, Dave. Glad to have you. Um, somebody says AppleNet. I do remember installing AppleNet. Oh, my gosh. I do remember that, that stuff. Yeah, when I first got in, everything was some type of proprietary system. There was NBI, 
There was ThickNet, ThinNet, Wang with dual RG59 coax. There was the IBM systems that used TwinX or, or Type 1, Type 3, Type 9. So I've been doing it for a long, long time. So very cool. Um, so first thing I always do on our after hours live session is what is your drink? It is after hours. So you're allowed to have an adult beverage. This is water with lemon essential oil. So <laughs> if I was be, if I was drinking right now, this might be a more entertaining show. But, you know, it's water. So sometimes I drink tea. Sometimes I do drink other things. But this is just water. In the comment box, tell us what you're drinking. Right? Let's, uh, let's let the, everybody know what it is that you're drinking. How do you turn it off? There we go. And then what we do is every Thursday night we do this for about 30 minutes or so, and you can submit questions. By the way, like I mentioned earlier for the for the pre-show, for the guys who logged on early, I do have a podcast. It's called Let's Talk Cabling. It gets produced every Monday. It gets published every Monday, sometimes on a Tuesday, but majority time on Mondays. Just finished up a, or not almost finished, a six-part project management series. Um, the... <laughs> Somebody's drinking a Captain and Coke. Nice. Um, so six part series. The first part was uh, definitions. The second part was what is a stakeholder. The third episode was uh, project initiation. Then the next one was executing and controlling. The one I just did last Monday, project closure. And it's kind of funny because that's the most critical one of all because that's where you get your final ten percent and uh, and. Um, get your final 10% payment. So, and, and we get held up because we usually do things wrong. So George said he's drinking water. Good job, George, because you're at work. You're not supposed to be drinking. Um, and, uh, and then the next one, the one on next Monday is the, excuse me, the final one. And I'm interviewing two people for that show because I'm going to compare and contrast the project management professional certification and the Big C's RTPM certification, registered telecommunications project management professional. So I got one guy I'm going to interview has got the RTPM. Another guy has got the PMP. I, they're going to be asked the same exact questions. And then that'll be the last one of the episode. Hey, here's, here's since you guys are the new 2021 one, uh, season, if there's a subject that you want me to talk about on the podcast, put it in the uh, in the comment section. I get comments all the time and uh, suggestions all the time. Uh, George, like I said, my most, most uh, admirable fan. He suggested one, and I did a show for him. Uh, I can't remember what it was about, but you know, I did one. <laughs> so if you'd like a subject matter to be discussed, put it in there. I've got the, I'll give you some ideas of some of the future content I got coming up. Let me look at my notes here real quick. So future shows. I'm going to do one on, if you noticed on our website, the Let's Talk Cabling website, I put three words right underneath the banner, and it says educate, encourage, and enrich. That's our three goals. Then I'm going to do an episode on teaching versus training. Teaching versus training. There's a big difference between those two. I'll explain that. And then I'm going to do an episode on, and this is not necessarily the order I'm going to do them in, by the way. I'm going to do an episode on earned value analysis, which is how you can actually predict how much revenue your project makes so you can make sure that you do it correctly. And then uh, I'm also going to do a uh, one on tips to successfully conduct a meeting. So i got lots of ideas, and I'm always thinking of ideas. And all we want to do, I kind of write them down in the, in my, my notebook and stuff. So lots of stuff going on on the channel. So uh, like I said, this live, this after hours will be recorded, put on the YouTube channel, and also linked back to our Let's Talk Cabling.com um, webpage. So let's get to the questions since uh, um, I didn't get any in the group. So if you happen to think of a question while I'm going through, make sure you put them in the group and I'll come back, circle back around. Let me put on my safety glasses. In case any of the words pop off the page and try to injure my eye, these are not reading glasses. They are safety glasses. So the first question comes from Atif Aman. I hope I said that name correctly. His comment, I mean, his question comes from a YouTube comment. And he goes, why are balanced cables called balanced? And then he followed it up with, what is the differences between a MUTOA and a consolidation point? So he asked a lot of good questions. But what, probably one of my favorite questions is when, when you get me talking about cable. I'm one of them cabling geeks that I love talking about cabling. So before I can tell you what the difference, what, what is a balanced cable, we have to talk about some other terms. By the way, I just did an episode on this. Well, I didn't just do it. I did it back in October uh, on the podcast. It's called uh, it's on October 20th, if I remember correct. And I think it's called Category Rated Cables. What's the difference? And I go in way more depth than I'm going to go in here today because I only have 
30 minutes with you guys today. So the first term I want to talk about is EMI, electromagnetic interference. EMI, uh, there's three components to it, an interfering source, a susceptible unit, and a coupling between that two. And when you put energy down a, ca a conductor, whether it's a communications cable or an electrical cable, it produces an electrical field that surrounds that cable. And if there's another cable that runs in close proximity, it's inside that, that field, that electromagnetic field, it will interfere with it. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be down a cable, though. I'll give you an example of EMI. As I mentioned to the pre-group, I live on a three-acre homestead in central Florida. We have goats and cows and, and all kinds of animals. My next-door neighbor, he lives down in Tampa. He comes up once a month or so. He's a ham operator. On his property, he has not one, but two huge ham antennas. And uh, when he fires them up, um, that creates an electromagnetic field around those antennas. And sometimes it can interfere with our Wi-Fi and some other things like that. That's EMI. So how do we get, by the way, there's also EMC, electromagnetic compatibility. Don't get those two confused because they're, they're diametrically opposed. EMI means something's interfering with the cable. EMC means that that cable is resistant against the electromagnetic field. So they're totally diametrically to each other. So when we send a signal down, the so inside this cable, right, this is the most commonly used cable in, 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 in voice and data cabling, uh, for station cables at least, it's a four-pair cable. So if you notice, there's four pairs inside of that cable. So let's take that blue pair, right? So the blue pair, if I was to untwist this, you will find there's two conductors. So we send that signal down both of those conductors. Now what happens is when we send the signal down one of the conductors, let's say the white-blue conductor, it creates, it's a, positive, it's a positive signal. When we send it down that cable, it creates an electromagnetic field that circles clockwise. Now, we, all, we have the way to invert that signal, right, the other half of that signal, and we send it down the other conductor. And because it's inverted, that one goes, the electromagnetic field is reversed. So when you couple those two together, it negates that EMI, right? That's why it's called a balanced cable. So the way they get rid of that EMI is, is that's the difference between if you look at the different category ratings of cable, right? So if you look at an old Cat3 cable, there's very few twists. When you look at the Cat5e, Cat6, Cat6a, they got lots of twists. And then when you actually even start looking at the pairs within the cable, let me see if I can do this. Let's compare the blue and the orange. For those who may never, never noticed this before, you notice the blue pairs twisted a lot more than the orange. So they twist the pairs at different rates so the pairs don't end effect with the other. And my German Shepherd evidently wants to be a part of the show. Mama, can you call Bubby? Um, so they'll twist the pairs at all different rates so they don't interfere with each other. Not only do they twist the pairs, they also twist the four pairs around each other to reduce that stuff. So that's why it's called a balanced cable. An example of an unbalanced cable would be like a coax cable because all that signal is put down the center conductor. So that's called an un. There's also, when you start getting into AV stuff, audio video stuff, you're going to start finding, especially with microphones and stuff like that, there's balanced cables and unbalanced cables as well. So you're going to have to deal with those. So the next question is, what is the difference between a MUTOA and a consolidation point? And i got to be honest, I used to get those confused all the time as well. Um, so let's talk about what those are. So when we run a cable from the telecom room to that faceplate on the wall, that's called a permanent link. When it goes from that faceplate all the way back to that patch mount. That's called the permanent link, right? Um, the reason they call it permanent is because once it's installed, terminate, test it, theoretically nobody's supposed to be altering it. Now you can if you're a technician, but usually you don't want the end user doing that. So when the standards first got published, we were running cables from the telecom room all the way to the jack, right? Nothing in between, just one solid cable all the way through. And then what we would do is we terminate on that jack. Now if you're doing modular furniture, right? You had to run that cable out through a single hole plate, route that through the furniture, and then put um, and then put a uh, sorry, someone's trying to call me a face plate in each one of those modular furniture cubicles. Then, back in the like I said, when we first started doing this, back then computer cable doing pe there were people doing computer cabling, and there's people doing telephone cabling, and a lot of times the people doing the telephone cabling was AT and T or Ma Bell. And when AT&T would run the cables, they would run a 25-pair cable or 50-pair cable to right above the modular furniture. And then they'd take this tool called an amp champ, and they would crimp a butterfly. It's a butterfly tool. They would crimp a special connector on that 25-pair cable. they put an adapter on it, which had 
uh, RJ11 ports on the front of it. They put their patch cords in that, run that down through the wall, and then they would plug that right straight into the outlet. That's called zone cabling. And so that's what a Mutoa does. So Mutoa gives us the ability to do that. So Mutoa, what you're going to have is a cable that runs from the telecom room, all, it's, and that's going to run to a, a, a Mutoa. And it's usually a box, a metal box, and it's usually either in the ceiling or sometimes below the floor. And then a cable gets terminated, usually on a patch panel, but it might also get terminated on like a termination block. And then you're going to run another cable from the other patch panel or the other termination block outside of that consolidation point, run it to a faceplate or into the modular furniture. And then back in that Mutoa, you're going to connect those two patch panels together with your third allowable patch cord. The Mutoa is not designed to be an end user interface. It is for the cable technician only. The Mutoa has to be at least 50 feet away from the telecom room, and uh, it's got to be secured and stuff like that. So now a consolidation point, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll back up, <laughs> get my things mixed up here. That was a consolidation point. The Mutoa is the faceplate on the wall. <laughs> got my things mixed up. The faceplate on the wall right by the modular furniture. All right. Now, so what you have there is the faceplate gets mounted on permanent building structure, usually right next to the furniture. And then the customer can then literally plug in the patch cords from that Mutoa, which is nothing but a faceplate. And then run the patch cords through the wall. So the Mutoa is an end user face, an end user interface with the cable plant. The consolidation point is not. That consolidation point is the box that's in the ceiling. So that's what happens when you do a live broadcast. You get to see all the mess ups. <laughs> At least with the with the podcast and the YouTube channel, I get to edit those stuff out. But just goes to show you, Chuck is a human being like everybody else, right? So then, so the biggest difference between a Mutoa and a consolidation point is number one, where it's located. Right, so the Mutoa is that face plate that's on the end of the cable plant. The, cons the uh, consolidation point is in the middle. You can't have a consolidation point and a Mutoa on the same thing. What you can't have is you can't have a transition point and a Mutoa at the same time. Now, for those of you not know what a transition point is, that's that's typically referring to under carpet cabling, and it's really a, another splice. And the same thing, that's what a consolidation point really is. I don't care what fancy name you give it. It's really nothing but a splice, a splice. And when you run a cable through a splice, as probably some of you people already know, it attenuates the signal and causes problems with the, uh, uh, the potential failure point. So that's why you don't want end users typically inside that consolidation point. So you can't have two splices. And that's what a transition point is. That's why you can't have that. So the next question was submitted by Aaron Williams, RCDD, PMP. And this one was submitted to me via LinkedIn direct message, right? So his question was, the TIA wiring standards are very expensive. In your opinion, is this information in the Bixie TDMM enough or is the TIA papers a must have? That's a loaded question. Okay, so let's talk about that for a second. For those who don't know what the TDMM is, that's the that's Bixie's document called the Telecommunications Distributions Methods Manual. It's a two, it's a three-ring binder into two, it's separated into two books. And the last time I checked, I want to say it was about 1,800 pages between the two. A lot of information inside that TDM. Now, so whether or not you need to buy the standards, it's gonna be really depends on two things. What is your role, right? And by the way, the standard, and there's lots of standards out there. You have the 568 standards, the 569 standards, the 606, 607, and, and all those fun standards. Um, each one of those standards, if you were to go on, you can purchase them from Global IHS. And if you were actually to purchase them, they range between three and $400. And there's about 12 standards, 11 or 12 standards for the telecommunications industry. So you do the math, 300 times 12. Who has that kind of money, right? So... But you can don't you don't have to necessarily buy the standard. You can actually um, do a subscription service where you subscribe to it and you get access to all the standards to pay a monthly fee. I don't know what that monthly fee is, by the way. And, um, and then when standards get updated, you automatically get the latest standards. If you buy the standards, you don't get the latest one when they upgrade. And they, they they update the standards about once every three years. So now you're at, now now go back to the question: Does the TDMM have everything that's in the standards. Yes and no. 
So when they write this, the TDMM, when they revised, and by the way, we just came out with the 14th edition a year ago. So when they come out with the 14th edition, at that time, it was current with all the standards that are out there. Here's the problem. It is, it's a huge project to update any Bixie manual because I was on, on one of the committees that did the uh, ITSM stuff. And so you got to, there's a whole back and forth and you got to submit changes and then you have conference calls and then you get down to do what's called the editorial review and you go down and do that. And then it's, you get another chance to change it. And it literally takes about a year and a half to two years to, ch to update the manual. So you won't see another edition of the TDMM until two or three years. Here's the rub. The standards don't wait for the TDMM. So the standards might get updated. So just going by the TDMM, you could find yourself in a little bit of a problem. You might It might be referring to an old standard. A new standard might have come out, like building automation or industrial Ethernet or mice cabling or anything of those things. Right? They might have made changes to that. So it may not have the most current information. So you've got to be really, really careful with that. So now I happen to know Aaron because him and I are friends on LinkedIn, and I happen to know that he works in West Virginia, and he's, a, he's an end user. So... His scenario, I probably wouldn't purchase a copy of the standards. And the reason I wouldn't is because a lot of the manufacturers, including the manufacturer that I work for as well, we have copies of the standards. So all you do is just shoot us an email and we will tell you what's in the latest and greatest standards. Not only do we have the latest standards, we also have people who participate in creation of those standards. So not only can we tell you what's in the standards, we can also tell you what's being discussed for the future one, for the future publication. Now, of course, it might change because they got to hash it out and argue and all that fun stuff. So we can even tell you what's coming up. So, you know, the best thing is to, if you don't have the money to spend, you know, two grand, three grand. Um, I just had a thought cross my mind. I remember when I did my Bixi instructor class, one of the master instructors spent $10,000 for a master license for the standards, which meant that he could put, he could print out all the standards at any time and just sell them for, for what he wanted. So there's that option too. If you have 10 grand, you want to make some money on the side, I guess. Um, but that's that's not with really with my brain. If you're an installer out in the field, do you need a copy of the standards? No. No, you don't. If you're somebody like my my old co-worker on here, David, um, he might want to have a copy of them, right? Uh, but you don't necessarily have to. You, you can rely on the manufacturer for a lot of that stuff. So the because the manufacturers they also generally will put out what's called white papers. That's just a technical document that discusses um, all the stuff that's in the um, the standards. So that's all. And just you, you know the manufacturer participates in those standard committees. You know that's going to be the latest and greatest. And if you find out who that person is within the company, so for example, if you want to know who ours is within the company that I work for, just shoot me a message after this meeting and I will put you in direct contact with that person. And he participates in, in, in meetings. As an installer in the field, you don't need the standards. The TDM is probably going to be enough. If you're an estimator or a project manager and you're responding to quotes from a customer, that I would say, yes, you do need a copy of the standards in that case. And the reason I say that is because here's what happens quite often. So in our world, there's this thing called consultants. So a customer will hire a consultant because the customer doesn't know anything about cabling. They'll hire a consultant, and that consultant will write what's called the RFP, the Request for Proposal. Now, our, you know, these, these consultants, they um, I don't want to say that they're lazy, but their time is valuable, and they see a lot of the same stuff over and over and over again, kind of like I do as, a, as, a, as an instructor now. So what they'll generally do is they'll take – a, an RFP from a previous customer and they'll copy and they'll paste it in the RFP for this new customer. And what happens is they forget to update, you know, the references to the standards and the codes and all that stuff. So you see all kinds of mistakes in there. And uh, if you're a consultant, then absolutely, you definitely should be having a, uh, a copy of the standards because you're going to be asked to, you know, you know, by the customer and you might, you might get challenged by a contractor. So, yeah, as a, as a consultant, you definitely want to make sure that you have a copy of those standards. So, so the next question comes from Ernest Ling. Uh, Ernest Ling sent me a email. Oh, no, sorry, direct message on LinkedIn. If you're in the chat and we're not friends on LinkedIn yet, look me up. Send me a friend request. I do a lot of stuff on there. I do articles and all kinds of stuff. By the way, 
Ernest Ling was also the winner of the recent contest that we just did. I did a contest in December to win a, a bundled set, Bixie Bundled Field Pocket Guide set. So he won his own set. And I just talking to him yesterday or the day before, and uh, he was telling me he just got them. So I might do a contest like that again maybe next year or I might do something else different. That's a really good bundle set, by the way. I do recommend that you get them. Um, so one of them is actually f is, is for general cabling. Uh, one is for fiber cable construction, and then the other is for copper cable construction. And they're called pocket guides because they're supposed to literally fit inside your pocket, although I tried, and they don't fit in my pockets. <laughs> so the field pocket guide says it's actually information that you can find in what's called the ITSM books. ITSM is uh, inform it stands for Information Transport Systems Installations Methods Manual. I had to think about that for a second. I actually participated in revision three and helped write that book. Um, so all the information in its manual is in, well, I can't say all of it because I don't know that for sure, but um, so they put it in a pocket form, say that way, if you're doing fiber, you can easily flip through the fiber book. If you want to know about, you know, you know, fire stopping or ladder safety, it's in the general book. Great, great, great resources. So Ernest won that bundled set and he shot me a message and his question was, are the field pocket guides good for study guides for the basic Bixi exams? So when he says basic Bixi exams, I'm assuming he means the old Bixi apprentice or an installer one certification. Now, he didn't speci specify that, but I'm assuming that's what he means. So my question, I mean, my answer to him is, while I do think that these are a great resource, and they have a lot of information that's right from the it's a manual and if you study them it will certainly help you to pass that exam i don't think it's all inclusive i think you might come across information on the test that may not be in those pocket guide sets if you want to make sure that you're absolutely sure that you have everything then Purchase a copy of the latest copy of the ITSIM manual. That's I-T-S-I-M-M, -M, the Information Transport Systems Installation Method Manual, because they base the exams on that manual. Now, for the Installer 1 and the, the Installer 2 Copper, Installer 2 Fiber, and the Technician exams, there's two parts to that test, right? One is the written test, so that'll definitely help you with that, but the other part is the hands-on test. That's not going to help you with the hands-on. Right, so... So that's a good thing that you might make sure that you have as well. All right. So let's see. Let's see some other questions we have on here. So um, let's see. Freaking is talking about what they're drinking from and people will tell them where they're coming from. So we do have a question on here. So one of the questions is, Chuck, where can I get certified to do fire stopping? Every manufacturer can has a class that they can do. Um, I'm actually working on a fire stopping class that'll be made free of charge. Uh, I'm going to submit it to Bixie for recognition. I'm, I'm aiming for a two-hour class, and I'm looking, and I'm talking about all kinds of fun stuff. But Hilti, 3M, Spec Systems, Unique Fire Stop Systems, they all have classes. And if you need CECs because you've got one of those certifications, then absolutely, you know, do that. Um, fire stopping is critical that you definitely want to make sure that um, that you do that. And make sure, and and the reason you do this because if you don't, if you install fire stopping incorrectly, not the way the manufacturer said to do it, you personally can be held liable for that. Keep that in mind for with fire stopping. So the next question is bonding and grounding. It says Chuck, I have a a small trailer, and the trailer it's a business trailer, it's a construction trailer, and they have voice and data coming to it. I'm building a rack. Can I attach to the structural steel of the trailer? You can, but that's not necessarily a good ground source. Um, the way that you're going to make sure that you do this is first you're going to take what's called a four-prong earth maker. And then you're going to have to take this four-prong earth maker. It's a kit, and it looks almost like a almost like a voltometer, but it's different because it has filters that filters out things that voltometers will register. So it's got these four little stakes, metal stakes, and you put them in a straight line at equal distances, and then you attach your leads to the um, – to those four prongs, and then you measure the ground. It's gonna tell you what the resistance of the earth is. And then it's also using that information, what's called the, um, 
Oh, I can't remember the name of it. Um, there's a specific name for the process. And I can't, the name just escaped me right just now. But there's actually a process you can go through and you plot it out. And it'll tell you how deep you need to go with that ground rod, depending on what size ground rod that you use. right? And the code book says that you have to get to 25 ohms of resistance or less. So with that trailer situation, I would definitely either drive in my own ground rod if I've been trained on how to use that earth maker or hire an electrician and then ground to that. Because I'm telling you, this, the steel frame of that construction trailer is not enough. And they get a, you know, here's the problem. If a bolt of lightning hits the ground, people don't realize this, that voltage goes through the ground. And if it's something on, on the ground, it can actually go into that structural steel of the trailer and then zap your whole network goes down. It goes down. There you go. Next question. This is going to be the last question because we're at 28 minutes already, and I've got a couple more questions. So if you ask a question I didn't answer tonight, I'll make sure I cover it in the next week's section. So the question is, Chuck, I've got a project. The customer wants to use their own labeling sequencing. Isn't there a way that the standard says that you're supposed to do the labeling? Yes, actually there is. Um, and there's the, the, the labeling system is broken down into four classifications, class one, class two, class three, and class four. Ooh, 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 ooh. Future podcast show. I'm going to write that down. Uh, show on administration. And here, here's the funny thing, right? I call the administration standard the most commonly ignored standard because most people don't ignore it. Most manufacturers don't. We'll give you a warranty if you don't follow the standards. They won't give you a warranty if you don't follow the standards for how to terminate the cable and test the cable. But when it comes to labeling stuff, eh, whatever, label whatever way you want. Uh, so for, as far as the standards concerned, yes, there is a specific way and there are specific components that have to be labeled depending on which one of those four classifications that I just kind of have to wait to mention and watch for that podcast. That's going to be a future podcast now that I thought about it. And it does tell you what. So for example, in the let's say you're putting a 24 port panel in a relay rack, and it's a small job, so you get just one relay rack, and you only have maybe like two or three patch panels. So the standard says that you really should be labeling that patch panel by the rack unit number. So a seven foot rack has 41 rack units in it, I think, and there it starts at the top, goes to one at the bottom. So if you put that first patch panel on that rack unit 41, you put a 41 on the patch panel. And then the cable lands on port one, we'd be called 41 1, 41 2, 41 3. If it's in rack unit number 37, it'd be 37 1, 37 2. You can also use A, B, C, and D. You know, one thing I've never understood is our patch panels and everybody's patch panels come labeled. Why do we relabel them? We spend all that time relabeling everything and it just causes all kinds of problems. And, and, and what happens to most of those labels? Six months after the job site's done, Half those labels have fallen off. By the way, I, um, I'm creating an expert council. Or all EDs and, and are engineers. And there, I can't answer every single question. For example, that, that, that labeling question that was just asked. I can answer that question, but if you were asking me specifically how to lay out, you know, within specific kinds of dimensions for certain types of passion, I couldn't answer that question. But Todd Morris is one of the people on my expert council, and he works for Brother Systems. I could shoot a question like that as well. So I'm adding some some experts to the to the expert council. So if I get asked those kinds of questions, so there you go. So we are at 31 minutes. I'm one minute past. I appreciate everybody coming. And like I said, for those couple of questions that I did not get to, I will answer them in next Thursday night show. So I'll see you next Thursday at six o'clock. Until then, everybody, be safe. <laughs>